back and I watch you explore Imperfect visions like I've been here before I see you, I see you Hello everyone, let's talk about lenses, specifically the ones we use for video. If you do any sort of professional video work, you know that video people love those big, chunky cinema lenses. They have those nice little gears on them, you can hook them up to a follow focus or a LiDAR. It makes those lenses easier and nicer to work with, and more importantly, it makes you look legit in front of a client. Well, I also love those lenses, but unfortunately, they are expensive. I want to have cool lenses, but for not expensive. This is a Helios 44, a legendary Soviet lens, the portrait monster, the king of bokeh, and now that they've used it in the recent Batman movie, it is objectively a cinema lens. Now, it's not a secret that these old Soviet, German, and Japanese lenses look excellent on these modern 4K sensors, but looking at it, you may notice a distinct lack of focus gears or any sort of cool features about it. Now, you could put some rubber gears on it, it will technically work, but those are extremely uncomfortable to use and they kind of look ridiculous. Now, this is also a Helios 44, but this one has been maxed. I regret nothing. The idea of converting a vintage lens into a cinema lens has been very appealing to filmmakers lately, which is why there are companies now like Iron Glass who will take your old vintage lens and they will convert it to a modern cinema body for a low price of $3,000? What the fuck? So clearly we're not doing that. But it got me thinking, what if there was a way to achieve a similar result to what these rehousing companies do, but without studying the lens's entire optical design and taking it apart and machining a new custom aluminum body and putting it all back together? Well, there kind of is, right? It's the floompy rubber gears. Some companies, like Tilta, make them in a way that fits the lens a little better so they don't have the dangling attachments and they're not floompy. But you can take it one step further and you can 3D print a gear specifically for the size of your lens. And you can 3D print a gear, 3D print a gear, 3D print... 3D print... That's right. At some point, I realized that if I could 3D print a gear, I could probably 3D print the whole housing. So naturally I went out and I looked for something that may have already existed, and so I found this guy on eBay who sells 3D printed cinema enclosures for my exact Helios, which is great. And it only costs $300? What the f- Now there's a couple of issues that I had with these designs. For one, I think it could look a little cooler. Also, I had more lenses that I wanted to rehouse, not just the ones that the seller provided. And then there's the $300 price tag. You see, like a good engineer, I decided that paying $300 for a finished product was too much. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend three months of my time and way more money than that to design my own solution that fits my own needs and is a special snowflake that works exactly the way I want it to. And here's how I did it. Fundamentally, it's not that hard. You measure the important parts of a lens, you base your design around those measurements such that everything fits and makes sense, except it's actually way harder than it sounds. See, this was my original 2D concept. I collected a bunch of popular cinema lenses to see how they're designed, what they have in common, how they work, and this is what I came up with. Now, this prototype worked, but it wasn't very good. 
It looked very cheap and amateur with the parts moving over each other. The gear design wasn't printing very well, but it showed me that I could do it. So I grabbed my iPad, I fired up Shaper 3D, I deleted everything and started from scratch, adding submillimeter tolerances, these cool slants at the edges of the front element, these awesome Ari style rounded cutouts, the Sure style tapers on the focus gears, PL style rear cap for absolutely no reason. I mean, I went hard on this thing. I had four main goals for this. I wanted the pro look for the entire set, so no obvious parts sitting over other parts, no gaps or size mismatches, that sort of thing. I wanted to have a consistent look across the entire set. I wanted to be able to scale this design to other lenses with relative ease. And I wanted the outer ring of the lens to have a diameter of 95 millimeters for attaching the matte box. So after weeks and weeks of refining the design, dozens and dozens of iterations, countless failed prints, this is what I came up with. I mean, look at this thing. It looks legit. You slap a matte box on this bad boy, you show up to the set. I mean, this thing is a budget tripler. It also weighs barely anything over its original weight, which makes it extremely easy to balance on even the smallest gimbal. Here's a weight comparison. This is the Sigma 2470. This is the Sony 90mm macro, Sure 50mm, and this is the budget tripler. One thing I did not have to do, but I decided it would be pretty cool, was I went out and I got this cheapo airbrush set and I coated this thing with a thin layer of black primer, which what this does is it eliminates some of that 3D print glossiness, that, that cheap 3D print look. It just makes it look a little bit more premium. The other thing that is completely unnecessary, but very cool and kind of sells the look, was the accent ring, right? There is a one millimeter outer edge on top of the front element, which I got this black metallic paint for, and I airbrushed that onto the accent rings along with some metallic varnish. And man, this just, this just looks so good. All right, enough history. Let's talk about how you can make your very own vintage cinema set for less than a thousand bucks. First, we need to pick the actual lenses. Here's what I'm using. Helios 44M-4, because it is awesome. Shannon 55mm f1.7, because I happen to have it. Zeiss Flectagon 35mm, which is an excellent lens. It's 35, which is a very universal focal length. It's very sharp, and its minimum focusing distance is very close. This lens is almost like a baby macro, which is really cool. Jupiter 9 85mm, which we will talk about soon. And finally, Zeiss Sonar 135. A cinema set does need a long lens, and this one was pretty good. You can find all of these on eBay or your local Facebook marketplace for anywhere between $30 to $200, depending on the lens. I'll put the links in the description to find them. Once you have the lenses, there's a couple more things you're gonna need. You'll need an M42 screw mount adapter. Now, this design was made for the Sony E-mount, because for the moment, I'm running a Sony camera, and this is the exact adapter that I'm using, this KNF Concept one from Amazon. These designs were made for this adapter. It might work on other ones, but that's not a guarantee. One of the concerns with this design was the spacing between the adapter cover and the camera grip, such that your finger can actually comfortably fit into the camera. It definitely works with these adapters. I cannot guarantee it for any other ones. You're also gonna need a stack of step-up rings. I'm using these ones. You will also need at least two sets of step-down rings, which is not a usual ring set you would buy, but you're gonna need at least two. Finally, you're gonna want an 82 to 95 millimeter outer ring adapter. I'm using ones made by this company in France. I don't know how to pronounce them. Precisio. They're very cool. The rings are super nice and high quality. And they also make these custom laser engraved velvet inside super cool front caps. These are pretty expensive and super unnecessary. So I had to get them. You're also gonna need a 3D printer or an access to one. If you don't have a 3D printer, there's probably a 3D printing service somewhere in your city that will do these for fairly cheap. 
I'm using a basic bitch Ender 3. I use it to print my FPV drone parts. It's never failed me. And the material of choice for this project was the Polylite PLA by Polymaker. All right, once you have procured the materials, you want to go to budgettriplersignatureprimes.com. That is real. That's a real website. Go there, pick the lens that you want to make, click download STLs, and once you have them, print them. All right, once you have all of your parts printed out and ready to go, there's a couple more things you're going to need. First, you want some masking tape, not electrical tape. It's important. They're different tapes. You're going to want masking tape. You're also going to want a box cutter or a pair of scissors, an M2 hex screwdriver, and a couple of M2 hex screws, specifically 12 millimeter, 6 millimeter, and 4 millimeter. Let's start with the Helios, since this is the lens that started it all. First, grab your step up rings and put them together. Also add a step down and a step up ring at some point during the stack. We basically just need two extra rings of thickness. Screw them onto the front of the lens, grab your adapter and attach it to the back. Next, grab your 95 millimeter ring and attach it to the front of the stack. Prepare your 3D printed parts and let's start with the front element. Grab the front element, slide it through the back. It should basically just snap to the 82 millimeter ring. If it feels a bit loose, grab some masking tape and attach it to the 82 millimeter ring to create some additional friction. At this point, the front element should be nice and snug on the front ring. Next, grab your accent ring and snap it to the front element. You should be able to just apply a light pressure to it and it will snap into place. Next, slide it back onto the lens, and at this point you might want to attach the lens to the camera so you can line up the sides of the front element with the actual sides of the lens. Alternatively, you can use the red dot on the adapter to do this. Next, grab the masking tape and attach it to the focus ring. The tape is a little thicker than we need, so I'm going to cut it in half. The goal here is to fill the space between the focus ring of the lens and the inside of the 3D printed focus ring. You also want to apply masking tape to the middle section before the aperture ring. Remember that it cannot be too thick, so you might want to cut it even thinner. You can grab your focus ring at this point and try the fit. It should slide in easily, but with a little bit of friction. You can also check the middle piece in a similar manner as well. The aperture ring on all of these designs is a friction fit. I'm not particularly proud about this, but this is just how it is. There's a little bit of a tapered edge on the inside that will make it easier to attach. The tolerance for the aperture ring is fairly small, so you might not need that much masking tape. I needed maybe one or two layers. Grab the 3D printed piece and slide it from the back so that it's nice and snug on the aperture ring. If you did it correctly, it shouldn't let you spin it past the edge without significant effort. All right, let's actually put this together. Start with the middle piece, slide it from the back and line it up just in front of the aperture ring. Get your six millimeter M2 screws and screw them into the holes in the piece. It doesn't need to be gorilla tight. We're not trying to drill through the lens here. It just needs to bite into the masking tape. If done correctly, it should prevent the middle piece from spinning. Next, grab the focus ring and slide it through the front. Screw in the front element with the step-up rings, which you can use to line up the screw holes. I find it to be more aesthetically pleasing when they're on the top. Grab your 12 millimeter screws and screw them into the focus ring. Once again, it just needs to bite into the tape. The focus ring should spin freely without too much friction or too much of a gap. If there is friction or a gap, it means that one of the rings isn't level. All right, finally slide the aperture ring through the back. Make sure that it spins properly. Then grab the adapter cover and snap it onto the adapter. We're basically done at this point. If you printed the caps, they have this little circular detent somewhere on them. This lines up with the red dot and the cap closes. Grab the front cap if you have it and it's done. It spins, it focuses, it changes the aperture and it looks awesome. All right, next up, let's do Shannon. Very similar design to the Helios. Get the adapter, screw it from the back, get your front rings. This one also needs the step up and step down extension. Screw it to the front, grab the front element and the accent ring, snap the accent ring into place 
slide the whole thing from the back, lining it up with the red dot, and once done, take off the ring stack. The middle piece on this one is solid and thicker than the Helios. Grab your masking tape, attach it to the focus ring, the middle and the aperture as shown, take off the adapter, grab the middle piece and line it up with the middle section. Next, slide the focus piece onto the focus ring and screw in the ring stack with the front element. Line up the screw holes and put 12 millimeter screws into every hole. Make sure that the focus ring spins freely Grab the aperture ring, slide it from the back as shown until it snaps into place. Make sure that the aperture spins correctly, make sure there is no visible gap or noticeable friction. And at this point you can put the adapter back on, snap the cover, attach the rear cap, attach the front cap, and Shannon is complete. Alright, next up, Zeiss 35mm. Slightly different, but very simple design. First, grab the ring stack, no spacing needed on this one. Screw it to the front, get the adapter, screw it on the back. Accent ring snaps to the front element, you know the drill by now. Attach it to the front ring and take off the stack. The focus ring here has teeth and it's a pretty low tolerance, so you're not gonna need that much masking tape. I'm only using it on the inner part of the focus ring. Tape up the middle in the aperture ring as shown, grab the aperture ring with the slant backwards and slide it through the front until it hits the dead end. It should be nice and snug and the aperture should spin correctly. Get the middle piece with the extruded part facing the aperture ring and slide it through the front. Next, grab the focus piece, slide it onto the tape and line up the screw holes. 12 millimeter screws attach this one as well. Make sure that the focus ring spins nice and smooth. The aperture should be working as well. Grab the ring stack, screw it back to the front, attach the adapter cover, rear cap, front cap, 35 mil is done. Next up, let's move over to Zeiss 135. Very similar to the smaller 35, get the adapter, attach it from the back, get the front rings, no step downs, attach them to the front. Accent ring snaps to the front element, front element snaps to the 82 millimeter ring. The ring stack comes off for the assembly. Masking tape is as follows. I did not need any for the aperture ring. And let's start with the aperture ring. Once again, the slant is facing backwards, slide it through the front, make sure it's nice and snug on the aperture ring. Grab the middle piece, the extrusion is facing the front. Line it up nice and tight, grab the focus ring and slide it onto the tape. 12 millimeter screws once again into all of the holes. Make sure that both rings spin correctly at this point. Attach the front stack, snap the adapter cover, verify that everything is moving as it's supposed to. Rear cap goes on, front cap goes on and 135 millimeter is done. And finally, the arch nemesis of this project, the Jupiter 9 85 mm Jupiter 9 is a god-tier lens that I really, really wanted to include in this set. However, it has a couple of problems. First, as you can see, the aperture is on the front of this lens, which is not a terrible thing. I mean, I wanted a consistent design, but I can live with one of the lenses having the aperture in the front. It's not a big deal. The entire front assembly moves when you focus. The aperture ring will not stay static. As soon as the focus changes, the bloody thing moves, which means if you have it hooked up to a motor, it doesn't work. So I had to go back to the designs and I have to come up with some clever pass-through mechanic that allowed me to drive the aperture ring with a control ring at the back of the lens through the focus ring that somehow allows both of them to spin freely but also lets me control, but I did it. The point is I did it. It's very weird but it works. And here's how to put it together. Let's snap the accent ring to the front and take a look at the other pieces. We have the focus gear with some channels routed through it. We have the aperture driver ring, the rear internal element, and the aperture ring that goes over it. 
I'm including a 3D print version of the rods, but I'm using these steel ones. They're like five bucks on Amazon. And what is five bucks at this point? Okay, you wanna make sure that your aperture ring is all the way to the right and your focus ring is all the way to the left. So the front assembly should be fully extended. Get the driver ring and slide it through the aperture ring onto the inner side of the assembly. Add a few layers of masking tape to the aperture ring. Might as well screw the adapter on at this point and slide the driver onto the masking tape. At this point, it should be nice and snug and spin properly. You also want to make sure that the aperture locking ring in the front is set to 16. Otherwise, the aperture will not fully close. It will get stuck at whatever value it's set on and you will not have access to the string later on. So set it now. Next, wrap the focus ring with some masking tape, grab the focus piece and slide it onto the tape from the back, lining up the edge of the channel with the hole in the driver ring. The inner layer of the focus ring hides a screw hole. Grab a four millimeter screw and put it into the hole such that it's flush with the surface. It cannot interfere with the movement of the rods. It should not be visible on the surface. Next, grab the rear piece and line it up in a way that has the outer channel on the left. So it will sit kind of like this. This goes onto the back with one or two layers of masking tape. Once it's done, you wanna grab those four millimeter screws again and screw them into the holes on this piece such that they're also flush with the surface. Remember, the aperture ring will be spinning on top of this. Speaking of which, grab the aperture ring, grab the rods and slide them into the holes. These are a little tight, so you might need to apply some pressure to it. But once it's done, it should look like this. And you wanna slide it through the channels, through the holes in the driver ring so that it ends up like this. At this point, if everything was done correctly, you should be able to spin the aperture ring in the back and the rods will move the driver ring and adjust the aperture. Screw the adapter back to the lens, get the cover, snap it. The ring stack goes back on the front and with both caps, the lens is now done. And there you go, consistent design with the rest of the set. The aperture works, the focus works. We did a team, good job. There is one problem though. You see, the one thing I couldn't quite solve was the combination of rotations. The focus throw... Unfortunately, this is a limitation I couldn't really do anything with unless I had the aperture ring moving, which was a no-go, and I can certainly find a way to work around that. At this point, your budget tripler set is ready and it's fully functional. You can go out and shoot with it. However, you may notice there's one thing missing, the markings. Now, here's how I recommend you deal with the markings. Don't, it's not worth it. It's a pain in the ass. Just, just hook it up to a LiDAR, have it focus automatically. Just ignore the markings, forget about them. They're pieces of shit, don't do it. Don't do it, James, I'm warning you. Now, if you absolutely must have the markings, here is what I recommend you do. Find a laser jet, print it on a transparent tape, and then wrap it around the lens. Right? I will include the actual markings, you can do with them what you will, but if you are going to use them, this is a way I recommend you do it. And now here is the galaxy brain approach that I decided to go with instead. Buy an expensive Cricut cutter machine, get one of their smart vinyl rolls. This is the similar stuff that Dbrand uses for their skins, for their phones and the Steam decks and whatever. Cut the lens markings onto the sheet of the vinyl, which by the way, really stresses the precision of this thing. So some of the numbers are gonna look a little floopy. Spend hours and hours painstakingly removing tiny parts of insides of the numbers and dots and such from the vinyl. Use the included transfer tape to lift the markings off of the sheet and transfer them onto the lens, repeat five times. Am I happy with how this turned out? Sort of. Was it worth it? Hell no. Just don't do the markings. I'm warning you. It's, it... And by the way, if you're thinking about using the reverse of the cutout to paint the numbers or something, I have already tried that. I tried painting it with acrylic. I tried painting it with an airbrush. It doesn't work. Just look, Stealth black is really cool. Just, just have your lens set be stealth black. It's, it's great, it's fine. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be fine, I promise, it's fine. 
Congratulations, your budget tripler cinema primes are now completed. If you want them to feel even cooler, you could even go back to that French custom cap company and order a custom Pelican for your set. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. It took forever to make. If you found it useful or entertaining, make sure to hit subscribe. There's going to be more cool DIY filmmaking projects and other cool stuff coming to the channel in the future. And yes, the editing app. I did not forget about the editing app. There's more updates on that coming soon. So hit subscribe, stay tuned. Thank you for watching. And remember, they're watching us right now.